Sing for joy in the Lord, O you righteous ones. Praise is becoming to the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with a lyre. Sing praises to him with a harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a shout of joy, for the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the loving kindness of the Lord. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope for his loving kindness, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our heart rejoices in him because we trust in his holy name. Let your loving kindness, O Lord, be upon us according as we have hoped in you. Amen. Welcome to First Baptist Church, Bennington, Vermont. I'm Pastor Joe DeWitt, and I welcome you to this Sunday following Easter. We're so glad that you have been able to join us, and we hope that what we say to you can give you some encouragement and some hope to lift you up in this time. Again, we are uh, doing video uh, service because we are under the COVID quarantine. We are uh, doing our best to social distance. We are washing our hands. We are being safe. And that's our hope and our prayer that you are safe as well. Please join me as I pray. Heavenly Father, we are so blessed. We are blessed that you, the Lord of all creation, of heaven and earth, the Lord above all lords, there is no God like you. Hear our prayers. We are here to worship you, to praise you, because you are worthy of all praise. God, pray that your Holy Spirit come upon us wherever we are and give us peace that surpasses all understanding. God, we pray that all we say and all we do be glorifying to you because we love you for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to the part of our worship service where we take a few minutes and quiet ourselves before the Lord. And we call this our time of confession where we listen to the Holy Spirit 
and have him gently nudge us in directions that he wants. So we quiet ourselves and we ask God, what have I done wrong? What could I do better? And the scripture that I've chosen for our, our call to confession today is from Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15. And I would like you to, in your quiet time, ask God, who do you need to forgive? For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. You can quietly pray. We worship a risen Lord, Jesus Christ, crucified, died, buried, and on the third day rose. And he sits at the right hand of God the Father. In Hebrews 7.25, the writer states, Therefore, he is able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Why do you have assurance of forgiveness? Because Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he continues to intercede on your behalf. Amen. The scripture reading for today, I actually have two. The first comes from 1 Peter Chapter 3, verse 15. But sanctify Christ as the Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And the second is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 3 to 5. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures. And then he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. Our music selection for today is... Were you there? Thank you. Number 129. And I'm going to do the first, and fourth, and fifth verse.
This is our opportunity to give back to God uh, what he has given to us already. This is our time for our tithes and offerings. And I'd like to urge you to prayerfully consider uh, what you're giving back to God, uh, to take some time and, and, and pray for it. Uh, the church still has finances. We have things that must be covered. We have work to do. And it's your tithes and offerings that help us uh, to do that. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver. All you have is from him. I ask that you prayerfully Consider to give God in love, in gratitude, in thankfulness. Doxology. Heavenly Father, you are so good. We pray that uh, with these tithes and offerings that we are able to do your work, to be the hands and the feet of Jesus in Bennington and in the surrounding areas, in Vermont and across the world, across the globe, God. In this time, in these desperate times, people look to you and we pray that we be your hands, your voice, to that world, to a hurting world, that we can bring the hope that's within us, that we can spread that to the world. Help us use these resources to do that, God. We give you cheerfully, we give to you thankfully, God, because you are so good. Amen. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, I lift up all the needs and all the cares, spoken and unspoken, of this church. God, there are hurts out there, and you know what they are without my even asking. The Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf when we don't know what to pray. But you know, you know us by the very hairs on our head. You know each and every one of us personally. God, I pray right now that your spirit come upon everyone and that they be touched by your presence, that they be encouraged by your spirit. God, I pray for those who are sick, for those who are sick not only from COVID, but all the other illnesses, God, which afflict us, which afflict our, our human bodily form. I pray for Charlie. I pray that you give him encouragement and that you touch him. God, I pray for our leaders. I pray that you give them wisdom and unity 
in this, in this time of crisis. God, I give you praise and thanks for the medical workers, the doctors and nurses, the first responders who put themselves in harm's way. God, I pray for a blanket of protection on them. God, I pray that you vanquish in a miracle way this disease. God, I give you praise and thanks for who you are. You are the creator of heaven and earth. Worthy, worthy of all honor and praise and glory. And because of that, we turn to you and we worship you. And we pray to you as Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So, here we are today, the Sunday after Easter. I mean, Easter, that's huge for a church, right? It's one of the big two, Christmas and Easter. We have special music for Easter. We have presentations. We have flowers dedicated just for Easter, the, the lily, right? Easter's a big one. Unfortunately, we sometimes hit an emotional low after something as big as Easter. I mean, as a pastor, the question becomes, what do I speak on? What do I do? I mean, how do you follow Easter? How do you top it? Well, I, I don't think you do top Easter. But hopefully today, I can continue to add to the change in our lives. I can continue to direct you in the changes that Easter has begun. Now today I'd like to look at an issue of apologetics. Um, the word apologetic, it doesn't mean I'm going to apologize. It, it, it's the defense of the faith. Now what, what's that mean? It means being, under, being able to understand why what we believe in is true. The verse I read for scripture reading, 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Now, the word defense, in the Greek it's apologia, which is where we get apologetics from. But, so why is it that we have this hope? Well, today we also read 1 Corinthians 15.3 and 5. For I delivered to you as first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve. Now these verses, they're part of an, of an early Christian creed. A creed is something that, that helped people to remember uh, something that was very important. They would memorize this and then they would recite it at, at every service. So this is very important. Archaeologists have dated this back to three to five years following the death of Christ. Now this is the gospel. This is the good news. Now why that's so important is Jesus was really alive and he was really crucified he died, and he rose again. L legends don't develop three to five years. Legends take hundreds of years to develop. Jesus was not just some good man or good teacher that 150, 200 years later, they added some stuff to his story. From the earliest beginnings of the church, the death for our sins and the resurrection of Jesus Christ was clearly understood, clearly taught, clearly believed, and clearly worshipped. 
that Jesus died for our sins is the heart of the gospel. And the cross has long been the symbol of Christianity. Jesus died for my sins. He died for your sins. Your sins are forgiven. Now I want to concentrate on 1 Corinthians 15, 3. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. And, and why did Jesus have to die? Now a very, very good friend of mine struggles with this. In fact, a lot of people use this as a reason not to accept Jesus Christ. I mean, it does seem a bit barbaric. Is it a stumbling block for you? I mean, what kind of God would sacrifice his son? Well, perhaps the first question to look at is, why does anyone, anyone have to die for sin? Well, someone has to die because of the nature of sin. There's a cost to sin, and someone always pays. Someone always pays some way, somehow. The nature of sin, ultimately, is rebellion against God. We see this in the garden, right? Adam and Eve, uh, God said, don't eat from the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, or you surely will die. We were created by God to worship him. Human beings are created to worship and love God. That's the reason that we exist. Now Jesus, he combines Deuteronomy chapter, uh, chapter 6 verse 5 and Leviticus 19.18 to make what we call the great commandment. Here's what he said. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together and one of them, an expert in the law, tested him on this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Now the phrase all the law and prophets, that's shorthand for all of the Hebrew scriptures, which we call the Old Testament. Now the essential nature of sin then is not loving God and not loving others. In fact, Jesus made the new commandment of the new covenant, the, new, the co commandment of the new covenant in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So when we choose not to love God and not to love one another, God suffers. He is harmed. Now, how is, how is that? Well, let's just look at the Ten Commandments for a second. You've got the first four. Obviously, God is harmed if we have other gods before him, if we use his name in vain. Uh, that's, that's pretty obvious. But God's also harmed if we murder. Say, I murder you. God created you. You belong to God. God is harmed. What if I lie? Well, God is truth. When I lie, God is harmed. If I steal, all things are created by God, and he's given you your things. If I take from you, I'm also taking from God. If I covet, basically what I'm saying is, God, you haven't done a good enough job providing for me. I'll do it myself. God is harmed. Not loving others is not loving God. And God is harmed. Sin costs. When we choose not to love others, God is harmed. So sin costs, therefore forgiveness costs. Now someone must pay and someone always pays, somehow. Consider this example. I'm leaving church, I pull out, and I hit your car. 
Your car is damaged. Now, you could just say, Pastor Joe, I forgive you. It's okay. Okay. But your car is still damaged. You still suffer loss. Now, you can turn into your insurance company, and then they pay. But you also pay your... Your premiums are going up, by the way. So, maybe I hit your car, and you say, Pastor Joe, will you pay for my premiums? Okay. I pay and you pay. We split the cost. But somebody still pays. Maybe you say, Pastor Joe, where did you learn how to drive? Do they, everybody like this drive in New Hampshire? Like, you hurt my car. You're going to pay. I'm going to make you pay. You're going to pay. I pay. You know, so do you. Because that anger and that bitterness, yeah, you pay. But that's like an economic example, right? Someone can harm you physically, emotionally, psychologically. People can steal your self-esteem, your confidence, your hopes, your safety, your future. We can't put a dollar value on those things. Sticks and stones, they break your bones, but words can wound just as deeply. And those wounds need to be paid for. And someone always pays. Now, why does sin need to be paid for? It's because of the nature of sin. Sin is rebellion against God, and God takes sin very seriously. You were created to love God and love one another. And God has established that the wages of sin are death. In both Hebrews 17 and 11 and, and Hebrews 9.22, we see that there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. Now, does that seem barbaric? Does that seem pagan? It would be if God didn't provide the sacrifice. God himself in the flesh. But why did Jesus have to die? Because there is... No one else. He's the only one who could meet that cost. Now, what's the real cost of forgiveness? Sometimes, I think when we talk about Jesus, God's son, dying on the cross, we, we lose some understanding of theology. Jesus Christ is fully God. He was fully God. In John chapter 1, John begins, In the beginning was the Word, Jesus, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Colossians 2.9, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. Hebrews 1.3, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. In Matthew, when Jesus was born, it says, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which, which means God with us. You know, recently I got a, a, a Facebook thing, uh, and I forget what church or who it was that, that sent it, but it, it said, Jesus Christ wasn't God. And it said that there's no place in the Bible where it said, oh, I just read you four places and I could have been up here for a lot longer that said that. Jesus Christ was fully God. Do not mistake that. He was not just a good man. He was not just a good teacher. He was fully God. And we worship a God three in one. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, Sometimes that's hard to, to wrap your head around, to, to really understand it. Uh, it's difficult to explain, but the, the technical theological term is perichoresis, where peri means around and choresis means to contain or to support. And so the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are contained around each other and support each other. It's one God, three persons. Not three persons and three gods, three separate gods. It's one God and three persons. Let's look at some scripture that kind of moves us in that direction. In John 10, 30, 
It says, I and the Father are one. And he repeats that in 1038. We also see the same idea, the Father and I are one. I am in the Father, the Father is in me. In John 17, verses 20 and 23. And in one, I love this one. In John 14, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. And Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you such a long time, anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, I don't speak on my own authority. Rather, it is the Father living in me who is doing his work. The three persons of the Trinity support and surround each other. We worship God three in one. My point here is Jesus was fully God. When we talk about Jesus being nailed to the cross, dying for our sins, it is God on that cross. God died for our sins. And the free offer of forgiveness, not so much free. It came as a great price for God. God himself stood in our place to take the consequences of our sin. However, Jesus also was fully human. He was born of the virgin. He was hungry. He cried. He got tired. He was tempted in every way. Jesus was fully God and fully human at the same time. And see, that makes him the perfect sacrifice. Why did Jesus have to die? Because he was fully God. If he had only been human, his death would have only applied to him. But because he was fully human, his death does apply to us. He's not just a bull. He's not just a sheep. Those were just pictures of a, a pointing to a greater sacrifice. It had to be Jesus that died on that cross because he was fully human and fully God. He was the perfect sacrifice. Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. Sin costs and therefore forgiveness is costly. But let's look at what the price tag really was. It's higher than you might think at first glance. And what do I mean? Well, what's the true price? First, understand what the phrase eternal life means. Eternal life is, is not something you get when you die and go to heaven. We have eternal life right now. Scripture is clear about that. You accept Jesus Christ, you have eternal life. Not you will get eternal life, but you have it. What is eternal life? Well, in John 17, chapter, uh, verse 3, he says, Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And we see this same sentiment in 1 John 5.20. Eternal life is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. We have God living within us, the Holy Spirit. That's eternal life. You have eternal life right now. Seriously, that should change the way you get up in the morning. The way you get out of bed, knowing that heaven is not waiting. You have heaven right now, heaven on earth. It will be better. But we have heaven right now. So think about this for a minute then. If eternal life is a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, then what's death? Well, death is the separation. Death is being separated from God. When Jesus was praying in the garden the night before he died, he was sweating blood. It was observed he was sweating blood. That's, actual, that's an actual medical condition called hermatidrosis. And it's, it's seen under people who are under great emotional stress or, or great anxiety. Um, it's a documented medical condition. Now Jesus knew what was going to happen. He was going to be crucified and die. But more than that, he knew he was going to be separated from God the Father and God the Spirit. The Trinity was going to be broken. The Father in me and me in the Father, that was going to be broken. When Jesus Christ cried out on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing that separation. He'd never known that in all of eternity. He'd never known that. That was the that separation, that was the price that was paid. 
for your sin, for my sin, for every sinner's sin before and after. He took your price. He took your place. He paid your price. His life for yours. Indeed, sin is costly. Now, think again about that eternal separation. If someone dies without God's free gift of salvation, they face eternal separation. If you believe you don't need God, if you believe God doesn't exist, God gives you that free will to choose. But, okay, why would you choose that? Let me be clear about this. No one is condemned for not believing in Jesus Christ. We're condemned for the sins that we've done. Jesus came to save. He came to pay that price. You can accept that or not accept that. If you accept that, your sins are forgiven. If you don't accept that, well, someone always pays. Now, why couldn't God just forgive sin? I mean, why any sacrifice at all? I really think the implied question there is, why couldn't God just forget about it? Shrug your shoulders and say, yeah, that's okay, I forgive you. Well, the answer is because it's not his nature. It's not who God is. The nature of sin requires a sacrifice. And the nature of God made Jesus the perfect sacrifice. First of all, understand that God is holy, righteous, and just. He's holy, which means he's set apart from the world. He's not of this world. And God is without sin. He can't tolerate sin. He can't be around sin. He is just, which means sin must be punished. But see, the nature of God also is that he is love. He is love. John, 1 John 4.19 tells us God is love. You take away the cross and you don't have a God of love. His character, his essence, his very being is love. In 1 John 4.9-10, he says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. See, God is both just and justifier. In Romans 3, 24 and 26, Paul writes, We are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. God is holy, righteous, and just. Sin must be paid for. Justice prevails, but... See, that sin is paid for by God. Love and mercy prevail. God's nature, holy just and righteous, and at the same time, full of grace, love, and mercy. That's demonstrated by the cross. Why did Jesus have to die? Because sin is costly and forgiveness is costly. Jesus became flesh and died on the cross for our freedom. He paid the price for our sin, but as they say in Boston, he reversed the curse. See, his death, the death of God on the cross, did more than just forgive our sins. He freed us from Satan. He freed us from sin. He freed us from death. In Colossians 2, 13 to 15, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over, him, over them in him. Hebrews tells us that Jesus became flesh and blood that through death he might destroy the one who has power of death. We are dead to sin and we are alive to Christ. Why did Jesus Christ die on a sin for forgiveness of sins? To free us from evil. To free us from death. 
Jesus has reversed the curse. We're free to love God. We're free to worship him. To have eternal life because of who Jesus is and what he's done. But there's another freedom actually. The death of Jesus has given us. And it's the freedom to forgive. You know, human nature dictates that when we're wrong, we need to revenge. We need to get even. Or maybe even a little bit further ahead. We need... When somebody trespasses against us, we need an eye for an eye. We need that pound of flesh. Jesus freed us from that human nature of revenge. Look, look to the example of Jesus on the cross. He's being crucified and he looked down and he said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they do. Jesus forgave. If we're being transformed into Christ likeness, we should forgive as well. Yep, during every service we say the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us, but lead us not into temptation. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And we stop at amen. Jesus didn't stop at amen. He kept going. If you look at verse 14 and 15, which we read for our confession. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. Now, this does not mean that you're going to lose your, your salvation. That's not what this says. The implications of this verse are that if you have an unforgiving heart, that you can't fully experience a relationship with God. That that, that, that unforgiveness acts as a block. And, and you cannot worship God the way that he intended. You can't know God. You can't know the blessings of God the way he intended. We see the same sentiment in 1 John 4.20. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. The, the cannot does not mean that, that, you, that God doesn't love you. And it doesn't mean that you lose your that you lose your salvation, what it means is you can't fully experience the blessings of a relationship with God. We're called to love one another as ourselves. And I said before, that comes from Leviticus 19, 18. But see, we don't usually read the full verse. The full verse says, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. We are not to take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people. See, the death of Jesus gives us freedom from that human nature. The death of Christ frees us from the need to seek revenge. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. We are free to forgive as we have been forgiven. Why did Jesus die? For the forgiveness of your sins, that you might forgive others. So today, I'm going to leave you with two prayers. First, to those who have never accepted the forgiveness of sins through Jesus Christ. So the title of today's, of today's sermon is, Why Did Jesus Have to Die and What's Next for Me? So if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, I ask, are you ready? Are you ready for the gift of eternal life? We say free gift, but it's not free. It costs Jesus. It's free to you. It doesn't matter how unlovable you think you are or what you've done or what's been done to you. Know this. God loves you unconditionally. Unconditionally. He's waiting. He loves you so much. He died for you. If you're ready today, I ask that you say this prayer with me. And bow your heads. Heavenly Father, I have denied you. I have fought you. I have resisted you. I have put myself above you and above others. I surrender. I surrender to your love. I accept the death of Jesus in my place for my sins. I turn from my old life. And I turn to a new life in you. Amen. You know, if you prayed that 
If you prayed that prayer, please send us an email. Uh, write us a letter. Let us know so we can help you begin that new life in Jesus Christ. Now the second prayer is for those who need to forgive. I ask that that be what we looked at during confession time. Has someone harmed you? Has hurt you? Taken something from you? I pray that you find the power to forgive. Unforgiveness is costly too. That bitterness, that anger, that builds up. That creates a wall preventing you from worshiping God, from experiencing all the blessings from a relationship with God. It's been said that unforgiveness is like you drinking poison, expecting the other person to die. Yeah, it doesn't work that way. You're the one that suffers from unforgiveness. But forgiving takes effort. It takes time. Healing's a process. If you're ready to take that step, pray to God that he might help you let it go. Pray that he might give you the wisdom to know what to do next. Now, forgiveness might just be between you and God. The other person may have passed on. Perhaps it's wise that you still avoid the other person to not be harmed again. Forgiveness need not put you back in a position to be harmed. Maybe you're not ready for forgiveness. Then maybe the pain is still too fresh, too, too raw. Then ask God for wisdom. Ask him for direction. Pray for healing. Why did Jesus die? Because sin costs. Therefore, forgiveness costs. Why did Jesus die? Because the nature of God is both just and justifier. Justice required that sin be paid for, but God took that punishment himself. Why did Jesus die? Because Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. Fully God and fully human. Why did Jesus die? Because as you are forgiven, you are to forgive others. Thank you. Thank you so much for worshiping with us today. It has been our great pleasure to be able to worship with you. We love God. We love God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind. And we love you as well. If you've 
prayed that prayer and have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please let us know. Our benediction today comes from Ephesians chapter 3. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. To him be the glory in the church. The church is not this building. You are the church. Please go from here. Go from your homes loving God, loving others, and forgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.